My name is Bernadette Clavier, and I'm the director of the Public Management and Social Innovation Program at the Center for Social Innovation. It is my great ple pleasure to welcome you all tonight at this, the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Did I just say business? Yes, that's right, you're sitting here in the temple of business. Is this, it, it sounds like the least probable place to have a conversation about regulation, about imposing costs on corporations, about intervening in free markets. Well, our 21st century students bring a collaborative mindset to everything, and when they're here for two years with us. They challenge themselves to change lives, change organizations, and change the world. And they don't shy away from very important and tough social and environmental problems. HIV AIDS, poverty, and yes, global warming. To get us started tonight, I would like you to meet two of our students. Jake Saper, and Mike Volpe. To take advantage of their time with us, they went into a deep exploration of our carbon intensive economy, a journey that literally took them to the top of the world. Both of them have decided to spend the next chapter of their career in the energy sector. And they're here tonight to share with us their journey of discovery and their hope for a US-wide carbon policy that will help them support their professional endeavors. So please welcome Jake and Mike. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jake, that's Mike. I'm going to start uh, by telling you about a trip that members of the business school community recently took to the top, I guess the bottom of the world, however you depend on looking at it, Antarctica. Uh, we had the trip of a lifetime. This was so much fun. We learned an incredible amount. But today I want to share with you the most fascinating takeaway for me from that trip. Before I do that, I want to tell you a bit more about the details of the trip. So there were 25 business school students. You can see us here uh, enjoying ourselves uh, on land. Uh, we also had eight uh, business and political leaders from all walks of life that joined. Uh, but, but the thing that sort of united all of us is that we had an interest in climate change and energy. So that was the theme of the trip. Now, some of the folks that we were very fortunate to come with us, some of the business and political leaders, included folks from all of these organizations. So we had Eric Pooley, author of the, the climate, uh, of the Climate War, and also one of the heads of the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, we had members of Al Gore's Climate Change or Climate Reality Project. Uh, we also had the Saudi Arabian ambassador to the United Nations. So as you can imagine, it was a, very, it was a pretty diverse uh, debate. It was a uh, robust discussion uh, that uh, I learned a ton from. The, the, one of the things I want to share with you was, was one of the scarier pieces of information that, that we learned uh, at the beginning of the pre-trip information. So we met with Professor Chris Field, who's a professor here at Stanford. He actually works with the UN. He's one of the top global climate change scientists in the world. Um, I want to share with you some of the data that he shared with us with respect to uh, climate change and particularly the effects of carbon uh, on the temperature of the planet. So this, is, this, I would argue, what I'm about to show you is, is the scariest chart I have seen on climate change. So the red line maps temperature. The blue line maps carbon, uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere over the past 300,000 years. This is in the Antarctic Peninsula specifically. So you can see that it roughly correlates quite closely. You can also see that the average carbon intensity, or rather carbon concentration, is around 250 parts per million. So you can see it up here. The, and it sort of bounces up and down through a natural carbon cycle. But you can also see up here that since essentially the Industrial Revolution and it's accelerated over time, the uh, amount of carbon in the atmosphere has increased. We all know that. Uh, what we don't necessarily know, what may come as a surprise, is that the temperature has already started to change. So in the West Antarctic Peninsula, the area that we were visiting, the temperature has risen four degrees Fahrenheit in the past 50 years. 
right? So we're armed with this data. We, we, we're, we, in, our, in our minds, we, see, we hear the, the number four degrees. We think that we're, we're going to get on a plane, we're going to show up, and the entire place will be an icy wasteland. We're thinking it's going to be melted. We're, gonna be th we're thinking there's going to be penguins languishing on lone icebergs in the middle of the ocean, circled by killer whales. Look, we've got this doomsday image in our minds. And instead, we see this. We see one of the most pristine locations any of us had ever witnessed. We see an area seemingly untouched by human hands. So how do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile the data that we saw with this, this beautiful view? In Antarctica, there's, there's no trash, there's no power lines, there's no roads, there's no buildings. There's no chance of seeing another human if you walk in any direction. It's an incredible, it's an incredible thing to internalize. But the, the, again, the, the, the cognitive dissonance remains in, in my mind, remains in my mind. How do you reconcile like, the fact that we know things are really bad with the fact that this seems to be a pristine environment? So we talked to some of the scientists on the ship to try to bridge that gap for us. This picture illustrates climate change. This is uh, one of the, the areas that we visited in, in Antarctica. Now, there's, it, it does it in a couple ways. One way is, is a little bit more obvious, and the second takes a little more explaining. So first of all, when you guys think of penguins, you probably think of penguins sliding down icebergs on their bellies, because that's what I did. Um, <laughs> but you see that there's a bunch of rocks here. That's because a lot of the glaciers have receded in Antarctica, which uh, many of you I'm sure are aware of. But the more subtle and perhaps even scarier evidence of climate change from this picture took some explaining. So there are five species of, of penguins in the Antarctic. And typically, these species, while social amongst themselves, aren't super friendly with other species. So they like to, they like to mate and nest uh, in different locations. Now, unfortunately, because of climate change, there are fewer places in which these penguins can nest ha and, and habitate for long periods of time. So they've all been forced to essentially live on the same little area. So this is what you've got. You've got a bunch of different penguins squished together, living in like a little penguin Manhattan, essentially. So this, again, this, this while I now understood the, the effects of climate change, I still struggle with this idea that I'm at climate change ground zero. And even though I'm at climate change ground zero, I still am not able to really understand and see what's going on until a scientist had to hold my hand and take me there. So how are you expected to internalize climate change, much less take action around it? And that led me to the most fascinating takeaway for me from the trip, which is that the hardest part about fixing climate change isn't the science, and it's not the technology. And I'll tell you, it's not even the financing. And I'm a business guy. It's communication. It is so hard to talk about climate change because it's, you can't see it. And we know it's so hard because so many of the attempts to communicate climate change to the world have failed. You guys remember this? This was popular in the 70s, 80s, 90s. It's kind of faded away, the Think Global, Act Local campaign. The reason it's faded away is because it never worked. The reason it didn't work is because it fundamentally misunderstands the nature of human nature. Right, so we evolved to respond to immediate stimuli. Right, so our, our ancestors would see fire and they'd run away. They'd see like a saber-toothed tiger and they'd run away from that. The folks that were sort of had their head in the clouds or were thinking a bit more globally, a bit more <laughs> abstractly, they got burned or they got eaten. Right? Like, we evolved, we are, we are the, the progeny of people that respond to immediate stimuli. Therefore, to believe that we'll go against hundreds of thousands of years of evolutionary training to start not caring about immediate stuff that affects us, but broader stuff, it's, it's unreasonable, and it fails. Okay, so we know that climate change is really hard. We see an instance of climate change communication failure. What is an instance of climate change communication success? So I'll offer up this magazine cover from New York Magazine immediately follow, following Hurricane Sandy. So what you see in the foreground here is the southern tip of Lower Manhattan. And you see the north, the north part of the island in the, in the, in the uh, background of the picture, which is all lit up. The reason is, I'm sure you're aware, that this is all dark in the front is because Lower Manhattan lost their power. So the reason I th say this is an effective form of climate change communication is you have to talk to audiences about what they care about. Right? At the end of the day, the people, if I'm trying to sell climate change to someone on the eastern seaboard in Manhattan, I'm not going to talk about the penguins. Because penguins are cute, but they don't care about penguins. What they care about is they had to like, live with their friends in the Upper West Side for like, a week because they had no power. 
right? What, what you need to explain to them is that events like Hurricane Sandy happen more frequently and are more extreme as a result of climate change. Similarly, if we're thinking about, essentially, th this thesis is that effective climate change comes down to empathy. It comes down to empathizing with your audience to understanding what you care about. So if, again, if I'm talking to someone on the Eastern Seaboard, I talk about this. If I'm talking to a business student, I wouldn't talk about this, nor would I talk about the penguins. What would I talk about? Business opportunities, right? Because like, that's what we care about. That's what we're getting paid to do eventually. We're getting paid to IPO companies, to take companies public. So this is a graphic uh, of a recent successful uh, public offering by Solar City. Solar City uh, is a residential solar company that's based out here. And I'll tell you, if I'm talking to a business school student, I will focus on something like this, because that's what they care about. I, I bet you if you guys walked outside and started talking to people outside and people were honest as to what they want to do, it's related to taking something public or doing something successful in this space. So you have to understand who you're talking to and what they care about. So in conclusion, I, I want to start to bring this back to, to the talk that Mary's going to give. Why, does, why is communication so important? So we know that communication is hard, but why is it really important? My contention is that communication is important because communication drives policy. Fundamentally, in a democratic society, unless we have consensus, our, our leaders aren't ever going to pass policy. And we won't have consensus unless we communicate that, about this effectively. So with that, I want to bring Mike on stage to talk a bit more about the policy itself. Thanks, Jake. It was certainly a uh, pretty fascinating trip down to Antarctica, and, and these insights were really authentic. So I asked the question of why are you guys here tonight? I believe that you're here tonight because you believe that continued emissions of CO2 will result in societal costs in the future. You're here tonight because you're concerned about events like Hurricane Sandy for your children, your grandchildren, and many generations to come. You're here tonight because burning fossil fuels results in negative economic externalities. So I said a lot there, and that's some fancy academic lingo. But let's talk about what I just said. An economic externality is a cost or benefit that is not internal to the transaction between a producer and a consumer. It's a market failure. A simple example is public education. People who consume education receive the internal benefit of the education consumption. Society at large also benefits by having an educated society. That's an example of a positive externality. Climate change right now is in the position that we're at because burning fossil fuels results in external costs which are not internal to the transaction. So, there are a few different policy options that are currently being discussed to internalize these external costs. One is cap and trade, and the other is a carbon tax. Before we go any further on the policy discussion, I just want to clear the air that both policy options aim to internalize the cost of carbon dioxide emissions, and I think that's a good thing. So let's talk a little bit more about cap and trade. This is going to be a bit of an academic exercise, and I'm working towards a goal of trying to share some insights uh, that I've derived in, in, in learning about this. So what we have here is a demand curve for the demand of carbon emissions in an economy. On the vertical axis, you have price. On the horizontal axis, you have quant. In a cap and trade regime, a regulator sets the quantity of emissions in the economy. This quantity is set as much by political will as it is by scientific insights. And we'll talk a little bit further about that. But based upon the carbon intensity of the economy and the robustness of the economy, with the cap or the limit of emissions set on carbon dioxide, a resulting market price for carbon emissions is set. So what happens as the demand for fossil fuel rises? Well, the demand for carbon credit rises, and you have a resulting increase in price. Conversely, as you decarbonize the economy or reduce the demand for fossil fuels, 
you have a resulting decrease in price. Throughout these scenarios that I've played out, note that the quantity of carbon emissions is held constant. Or in a cap and trade, the thought is that in the future you'll continually reduce the amount of carbon that is allowed to be emitted. The other policy solution is a carbon tax. In a carbon tax, regulators set the price of carbon based upon what they believe the external cost of each marginal emission is uh, accounted at. Again, that's a lot, but regulators set the price for carbon, they internalize it, and as the robustness of the economy as demand for fossil fuels changes, you will have a change in the quantity of carbon dioxide emissions, but you'll have steady long-term pricing. So as I've looked to this, and the, and the key takeaway that I wanna share with you in the policy discussion is one that's somewhat, I'm coming to learn more and more as I mature. Everything in life has trade-offs. Under a cap and trade regime, you are trading off certainty on the emissions of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for uncertainty on what the long-term price of carbon is. Alternatively, under a carbon tax regime, you are trading off predictable, stable pricing for uncertainty on the carbon dioxide emissions. Now, certain regimes such as California's cap and trade has a price floor which escalates with time. So it's not strictly a uh, cap on the quantity where the price can uh, fluctuate wildly. There is, there is a floor price, but you will see some long-term price volatility. So before we bring Mary up, I'd like to revisit the question that I opened with of why are you here tonight? Stanford University sits at the nexus of business, science, technology, but it seems as though there's one piece that just needs to be bolstered, and that's policy. There are thousands of young minds on this campus eager to solve big problems like climate change. So I have one request as you leave tonight. The next conversation that you have about climate change, try and get to know what the person who you're speaking with cares about. What's top of mind for them? What, what are they gonna make their decisions upon? Because without empathy, it's tough to have effective communication. And without effective communication, it's tough to have the political will to take the policy measures necessary to unleash these young minds that are ready to pursue these problems. Thank you.